This morning we're in Luke's Gospel. If you'd like to follow along in the reading of it, Luke 19. Luke 19, we're going to look at verses 12 through 27. And actually, I think I cut off just a snippet of the beginning, so I'm going to just back up to verse 11 that gives us a bit of the context of, in which Jesus gives this parable. So Luke 19, beginning in verse 11. Luke, through the inspiration of the Spirit, writes this. And while they were listening to these things, he went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem. And they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. And he called ten of his slaves and gave them ten minas and said to them, Do business with this until I come back. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. And it came about that when he returned after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him in order that he might know what business they had done. And the first appeared saying, Master, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good slave. Because you have been faithful in a very little thing, be in authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Your mina, master, has made five minas. And he said to him also, And you are to be over five cities. And another came, saying, Master, behold your mina, which I put away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you, because you are an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, By your own words I will judge you, you worthless slave. Did you know that I am an exacting man, taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow? Then why did you not put the money in the bank? And having come, I would have collected it with interest. And he said to the bystanders, take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has the ten minas. And they said to him, Master, he has ten minas already. I tell you that to everyone who has shall more be given. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. But these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, I really, <laughs> what more needs to be said than what's already been said? But we do need to look a little bit more carefully at what the Lord is saying to us this morning. Now again, in this particular series, uh, as we've been doing these evangelistic services, we've been looking at the reasons why people will not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, will they not, why they won't trust him. And I think we see this morning uh, one of the main reasons why they won't, and that is because they don't want to obey him. I mean, most people want to do, I mean, everybody wants to do what they want to do. They want to do their own thing. They just want to have fun. But they want to have the kind of fun that the Lord won't allow them to have. And the fear is that if I trust in Jesus, if I, if I receive him as my Lord and Savior, then I'm going to have to do things I don't want to do and I'm not going to be able to do the things that I would like to do. Maybe that is the reason why some of you haven't become Christians. You haven't trusted Jesus Christ. Well, I want you to notice that this is, in essence, the same, the same attitude that was in one of the groups that Jesus is addressing in this parable. I mean, one of the groups said, that is, those, those people of the country who were not his slaves, we do not want this man to reign over us. It's exactly the same attitude. And I also want you to notice what happened to them when the Lord returned. Verse 27, very sobering words. 
But these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. Now I think you, you understand if you understand the scriptures and the context of what Jesus is talking about here that he is addressing a particular circumstance. He is talking about what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem, what the Jews were going to do to him, what it was that was going to send him on this long journey to receive the kingdom. They were actually going to kill him. But of course, there were going to be that group of slaves that were his that were going to labor until he returns. But when he returns, he was going to take these people who didn't want him as king and rejected him, and he's going to destroy them. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ did when he returned in 70 AD. He brought judgment on the Jews. He destroyed their city. He destroyed their temple. He brought judgment on them because they did not want him to reign over them. They wanted Caesar rather than Jesus Christ because of their hatred of him. Now, the uniform testimony of the scriptures is basically this is the way that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to treat those who will not submit to him. This didn't apply just to the Jews. Psalm 2, we saw, actually applies to the whole world, to the leaders of the world, as well as to the citizens of the world. Submit to the Son and honor him. Otherwise, he'll become angry and you will perish in the way. His wrath may soon be kindled, but how blessed are those who take refuge in him. Now, that's the way the Lord treats those who will not obey him. The question is, do you have any reason to believe that he's going to treat you any differently if you don't obey him? Now, you might say, as many Christians would say, and I'm sure if, if people from broad evangelical churches were here this morning, they might say the same thing. Wait a minute. I thought God loves everyone. And that he has a wonderful plan for my life. But God wouldn't kill me. He wouldn't judge me for disobeying him. He won't cast me into hell. There are people, I've, I've talked to people who believe that. God's not going to throw anyone into hell. God is a God of love. And that's not a very loving thing to do. He's not going to do that to me just because I won't obey him. Well, maybe that's what you've heard. Maybe that's what you've thought. But if that's what you think, you need to see that you're wrong because that's not the way things are. If you don't obey him, the Lord says that that's exactly what he is going to do to you. And by the way, this is not just future. This is something the Lord actually does every day. I don't know if you've read Romans chapter one lately, but that's exactly what Paul is saying, that when people reject the Lord Jesus Christ, when they refuse to honor God as God, when they continue to disregard what he shows them in the creation, God is judging them. He is pouring his wrath out on them from day to day. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, when is it that he is actually doing this? Paul is not talking about the future. He's from what he's saying here, from the, the tense of the verb, which is present. This is something that the Lord does every single day. Have you ever asked yourself why there's so many you know, catastrophes going on in the world, so many fires and earthquakes and tsunamis and things like that, hurricanes? Why do those things happen? Are those things outside of God's control? And the people whose, whose lives are affected by those things outside of his control? No. Those things happen because God's wrath is revealed from day to day against sin. Obedience brings blessing, but disobedience brings curse. A lot of people die in those things. And on the day of judgment, the Lord says that he is going to throw those who would not submit to him into the eternal fire. Again, Matthew chapter 25, verses 41 through 43. The king will say to the goats, those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Well, why, Lord? Why are you going to throw us into the fire? 
He gives the reason, for I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. In prison, and you did not visit me. Now, we know that we're not saved by works, but if you are saved, your life will be full of good works, and those works are the evidence that you are a true believer. And so that's what's going to be put on trial on that day, your works, not your profession. Are you actually obeying? Well, these didn't obey, and for that reason, the Lord says, these will go away into eternal punishment. Now, this is what the Lord says he will do to everyone who does not obey him, not just the select group of people, but every single individual who will not submit to him. This is what the Lord says he will do to you if you do not obey, if you do not turn from your sins, trust in Jesus Christ, and then do what it is he commands you to do. Now, again, why does God say this? Why does he warn us of these things? Is it because he's vindictive and hateful and wants everyone to perish? No, it's so that you will turn and you will submit while you still can and receive his life and not his judgment. Now, I think we should go a little bit deeper into this and try to understand, again, why it is that God requires what he does. Is it wrong for him to ask us to do these things or to command us to do these things? No, it's absolutely right that God do this for several reasons. I'll just deal with a couple of them. The first reason is because God is the one who is telling us to do these things. And he has the right to tell us to do these things because he is God. And God is not a man. It's not as the Mormons believe that he's some kind of glorified creature that was the creation of some other God. He is God, and he has the right to command what he wills. The reason being, of course, is because he is the creator. He is the one who made you. He has the right to tell you what to do. He is the one who provides for you every single thing that you have, every breath of air, every morsel of food, every stitch of clothing, the, the, you know, the, the housing that you've had, every good thing comes down from God. And for that reason, you ought to obey him. And certainly, you ought to obey him because of, of who he is and what he is. He's absolutely perfect. God has the right to command you. Just as when you make something and it belongs to you and you have the right to dispose of that thing however you will, God has the right to do the same with you and to tell you to do what he wants you to do. And I think it becomes all the more clear when you understand that what he's asking you to do is the right thing to do. You know, sometimes we, we don't want to do something because an authority is telling us and our sin just kind of wells up and it says, I don't want to do that. You know, like, don't step on the grass. You want to step on the grass. Don't touch the paint. You know, it's wet paint. Well, you want to touch the paint. If somebody says, don't do this, that's what you want to do. That's what sin does. And sometimes that's the way we respond. I mean, we all do, apart from God's grace, to his commandments. But realize that what he is telling you to do is simply to love him and to love your neighbor. I mean, is that so bad? Think about what we read about in Romans chapter 13. Paul writes, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, I think if you were to go around and ask people, what you, sh what you should do. Should you love other people or should you hate other people? I think most people would say you should love other people. I mean, remember John Lennon's song, All We Need Is Love, you know, and so forth. People talk about love. They want love. And during the 60s, they wanted to, you know, share this free love and so forth. And there's the problem. The fact is that people want to love, but 
the kind of love that they're thinking of is not really love. It's not that which will help other people, but that which will help them, that will basically, uh, uh, you know, help them get what they want rather than helping other individuals. God is the only one who can really tell us what love is because he is love. He is the one who can tell us and he is the one who actually has in his commandments. So if you really want to love, you need to obey those commandments. Now if his commandments are in fact the definition of love, then what are you really doing when you do not obey them? What are you doing when you do not submit to the Lord Jesus Christ? Because he's not giving you a whole other set of commandments other than the Ten Commandments. Those are the ones he wants you to obey. Well, the fact is that you're hating other people. When you uh, break the first four commandments, I mean, think about it. God says you shall have no other gods before me. What if you have other things in your life that you actually do love more than God? You have an idol something that, whether it's a person or a thing, that you devote yourself to. What is that saying about God? What is that, you know, what is that relating to him? Except hatred or offense. I mean, if you could compare anything on earth to God and love it more than him, your spouse, your child, your house, your possessions, your money, your bank account, whatever it could be, that's nothing compared to God. And when you love that more than you love him, that's offensive to him, and that is hating him. And the same thing when you use his name as a common swear word, or when you take the day that he has commanded you to set aside for his worship and to rest from your worldly labors, and you spend it on yourself. He says, I want that day to be a day for you and me to spend together, but you go off and do something else and, and just simply leave him behind. That is offensive to God. That's not loving him. To love him, you put him first. You treat his name as holy. You worship him in the way that he would have you to worship him. And you rest on his day and you spend that day with him. Same thing is true with regard to the other six commandments that have to do with loving our neighbor, as Paul was referring. When you reject lawful authority, when children disregard their parents, or when we rebel against the government, uh, when they're actually telling us to do the right thing. That is offending them. That is hating them. Or if we actually want to hurt somebody in our heart or actually do hurt them or kill them, obviously that's hating other people. Or when we engage in sexual relations outside of marriage with other people, we hurt them, we injure them. Or if we steal from them or we lie about them, or we want or are jealous about, with, about the things that they have. We want those things. You see, these things that God is telling us in the Ten Commandments are telling us how to love other people and how to love Him. And when we don't do those things, when we break those commandments, we are actually hating Him and others. Is it any wonder then that God deals so severely with those who live in this way. Now again, you may have thought that God, a God of infinite love, can never possibly do this. He can never punish anybody in this way that we read in Scripture, bring these enemies here and slay them in my presence, or honor the Son and worship Him, or else you're going to perish in the way, or you know, take these away and throw them into the eternal fire because you didn't do this, this, and this, and so forth. You may have thought a God of infinite love can't do that, but you're wrong. God is a God of infinite love, but what he loves is what is right and what is good and what is loving. And he must punish. His love of what is good requires him to punish hatred and sin because sin is hatred. If you refuse to love the Lord, but hate him instead, the one who is pure love, who loves what is right and good, can only punish you. So basically the bottom line is this. If you won't obey the Lord, this is what he must do to you, and now you know why. Perhaps now you see it a little bit more clearly. Your idea of fun 
you know, what it is you want to do. I don't want to, you know, submit to, to the Lord because I've got this idea of the things I want to do with my life. I want to have this fun. Now you can understand why God will punish you for wanting to do those kinds of things because your fun offends him. Your fun injures your neighbor. It hurts your neighbor. It will bring God's judgment down on you. That's the way it is. That's the bad news, by the way. Again, the Bible does have bad news. If you don't understand the bad news, you're never really going to understand the good news. God loves what is good and right so much he must punish sin. He has to. Otherwise, he does not really love righteousness. But we need to realize that the same love that God has for what is good also causes him to be merciful and gracious. There is nobody that God saves who is not his enemy. God is gracious to his enemies. As a matter of fact, the Lord in his word, in the gospel, has actually offered to forgive all those crimes that we've committed against him, all those crimes that we have committed against our neighbor to completely blot those things out and to grant to us eternal life. The Bible says that even though we've offended him, he is more than willing to be reconciled to us through the gospel. The Bible says that God's love is so great that he sent his only begotten son into the world in order to obey him perfectly, in order to lay down his life on the cross to pay for the sins of those who would actually put their trust in him so that those who would trust him would not be judged, would not be condemned, would not be destroyed on the way, would not be slain by the Lord and cast into the lake of fire, but instead would be brought into the household of God, made his own sons and daughters, be provided for throughout life and protected, and then eventually brought into heaven when they die. The Bible says that if you will turn from your sins, from your rebellion against the Lord, and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he will save you. But again, remember that it's not just a prayer he wants you to pray. It's not just coming forward at an altar call and saying, God, forgive me and please give me eternal life and then to go on and live the way you were living before. The Lord wants you to submit to him. He wants you to turn from your sins, from your rebellion, from your hatred of him and others and begin to love him, begin to obey him begin to love others by keeping these commandments. So if you will do these things, he will save you. He will forgive you. He will give you his son's obedience as a free gift. Credit it to your account and then look at you as though you are his son having obeyed and loved perfectly. The Bible says that God's mercy has no limits. There is no one who is really beyond the reach of his grace. God is able to save to the uttermost those who will trust in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you are one of those who will not submit to him, will you turn to him now and trust in him now and submit to him now? If you do, he will give you eternal life. Now, I want you to realize, uh, secondly, that this passage of Scripture we've read doesn't just address those who are outside the church, those who are outside of a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It actually is addressing two groups of people. You might even say three groups total. So there's something else I want you to notice in this passage. The other group that is mentioned, and that is his slaves. Before he goes on this journey, he entrusts his slaves with his possessions, and he says, trade with these things until I return. And then there's this other group of people who never wanted him to reign over them in the first place. And so when he comes back, he destroys those people. But first, he calls his slaves to him to see what it is they did with what he had entrusted to them. These are those who actually, uh, well, submitted to him in a certain sense. 
and received him as the Lord and as the Savior. And now he's returning to see exactly what it is that they have done for him. I want you to notice what happened to them. There was one servant who was, actually there were 10 servants total, each trust, entrusted with a mina. One of them comes up and says, Lord, your mina has made 10 minas. And he says, well done, faithful slave. I'll make you ruler over 10 cities. Another one comes up and says, Lord, your one mina has made five minas. Well done, be over five cities. And then one comes up to him and says, Lord, here's your mina. You know, I, uh, I didn't do anything with it. I just kind of, I hid it, I saved it so that you would have it when you came back so I wouldn't lose it or whatever the reason. And the Lord said to him, you lazy, worthless slave. He took the mina from him and he gave it to the one who had 10, leaving this one with absolutely nothing. Now what happened to that man who had the one mina and then lost the one mina? Well, the Bible says that his end was like that of the enemies who did not want this man to reign over them. Certainly this is the case in the parable of the talents, which is very similar to the parable of the minas. And I think we are to assume has the same end. In Matthew 25, verses 28 through 30, this is what the Lord says. Therefore, take away the talent from him. Remember this guy, he received one talent and he hid it, just like the guy with the one mina, didn't make anything with it. He was a lazy, worthless, wicked slave. He says this, Take the talent from him, give it to the one who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, where exactly did this servant end up? Did he end up in some sort of nether region of heaven where he had to suffer for a while and then was going to come into glory after a while? Or was he, that's what some people seem to think, or was he cast into hell? Now, this description, weeping and gnashing of teeth and darkness, this is a description of hell. It may be a place of fire and torment, but it's dark, and it's painful, and that's what he's talking about here this servant ends up in the same place as the other servants who would not serve the Lord. I want you to see the commonality between them. These other people would not submit to the Lord. This servant who said that you're my Lord wouldn't submit to him either, would not obey him, would not labor for him, which is why his mina did not make anything for his Lord. So this is another person who professed to know Jesus but didn't really know Jesus he really did not obey him. I don't think the Lord is telling us here that somebody who actually trusted in Jesus Christ was lost. But I think what he's telling us here is that there are some who are in the church who actually profess to know Jesus Christ, but their hearts are in the same condition as his enemies. They are not saved. And they show the fact that they're not by the fact that they do not obey him. Jesus says that if you are his child, if you're my disciple, you will do what I command you. John tells us in 1 John chapter 3, verse 7, little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. It's the one who obeys the Lord. The one who does his will, not just the one who says I'm a Christian, not just the one who says I've prayed the prayer, I've trusted in the Lord, but the one whose life is transformed by the gospel, who actually has the spirit of God working within them, giving them a love for the kingdom of heaven and for his will. I mean, he writes the law on our hearts. He is that principle of grace that fulfills the law in us. And by the way, that fulfillment of the law in us simply means he gives us the desire to do what God commands us to do, and so we do it. There is no such thing as a true believer who does not obey the Lord. So this is a warning against those who actually 
say they trust in the Lord Jesus, but their lives are no different than anybody else's. They are not serving the Lord. They are not obeying him. They are not submitting to him. Their end will actually be the same. And if we look at the rest of Scripture, we actually find out their end is going to be even worse. If you know the truth, if you know what the Lord requires, if you know who Jesus is, if you know the way of salvation, you know all these things, and you don't act on them, your end will be actually worse. That slave who knew his master's will but didn't get ready will receive many lashes, Jesus says. And those lashes are not in heaven. Those lashes are in hell. But the, the servant, the slave who didn't know his master's will but did deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. The more you know and reject, the more severe your punishment will be. And so what does this say to you then if you happen to be in this situation? Well, you need to look at your life. Ask yourself these questions. Are you obeying the Lord? Are you doing what he tells you to do? Are you picking up your cross and following after him? So many churches today, so many Christians believe that the gospel is all about how to save you from hell but allow you to live the life you want to live anyway and just go on doing what you were doing before but now you don't have to worry about hell. That's not what the gospel is. The gospel is all about turning from your life of self-service as well as, of course, rebellion. That's basically the same thing. And turning you into the direction which the Lord wants you to go, and that is you become his servant and you do his will. You don't do things your way anymore. You don't do things for your glory anymore. Or the work that you do, you do for him. Doesn't mean you have to quit your job. Doesn't mean you have to go into full-time Christian service. That's not what he's saying. But everything you do, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, you begin to do it for God's glory. That's what Paul means when he says, offer yourselves up as a living sacrifice, acceptable to God. Give your whole life to him. That's what the Lord requires of you. So examine yourself. Is that what you're doing? Are you working for God's glory? Are you setting your life aside, as it were, to live for him? Well, make sure that you are. Make sure that you are trusting Jesus Christ. Make sure that you are repenting of your sins. Make sure you are submitting to him and seeking to do his will. Because if you're not, regardless of what you say, the Lord is going to treat you as an enemy on that day unless you repent, trust him, and submit to him. May the Lord give us grace to receive what he says in his word, knowing that he tells us these things because it is good, because it is right that we know them. And he tells us in advance while we're still alive, while we can still respond to these words so that by his grace we might do that so that we will be received by him on that day and not judged and slain with the rest of his enemies and cast into the lake of fire. May the Lord help us, each one of us here, to do what he calls us to do. But let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us to apply his word. It doesn't do any good to hear and not respond. We have to do what he calls us to do. If we only know but don't do, it just makes us more guilty, guiltier in the sight of the Lord. Let's pray that God would give us the grace actually to do what he calls us to do.